Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Well, for a number of weeks now, we have been uh, focusing on the subject of generosity, and we come now to the final sermon in the series. And I'm sure that uh, this has been a rather difficult series to listen to, and uh, I can also tell you, though, that it hasn't exactly been an easy one to teach on either. Uh, Research tells us that the fifth greatest fear that people have is the fear of death. The fourth greatest fear um, is the fear of parting with their money which may explain why people get so uptight when we talk about money in church. People would rather die than part with their money. So that's kind of eye-opening. But you know what the number one fear is? Public speaking. So you think about that just a little bit. If the number one fear is public speaking and the number five fear is dying, that means people would rather die than do what I do week after week. And... uh, (laughs) <laughs> and if uh, people would rather die than part with their money, imagine the pressure I feel making, talking about the joy of generosity and parting with your money on a regular basis. I don't feel much sympathy in the air. I mean, folks, where is the love? Come on, come on. <laughs> now, by the way, if this is the first time you've attended Center Street, I want you to know that we are not the stereotypical church that always talks about money. We talk about it every once in a while because it is in the Bible. But most of the time, we talk about love and sex. (laughs) So if you don't like today's topic, be sure to come back next week, okay? All right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Okay, well, in this series of messages, uh, we've explored a number of um, biblical principles of generosity including all that we have. All that we have, God owns. All that we need, God supplies. And all that we give, God promises to multiply for his glory. Well, in this final message, I want to get really practical and address the issue of how we honor God in our lifestyle and the financial decisions that we make. In other words, how do we determine what God's call to be generous and to live simply means for us on a day-to-day basis. But before we get into it, would you join me again um, and, uh, in dedicating our time together? Would you stand, uh, please? Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you again, Lord, for your word and for the guidelines we find in it for living. The guidelines in it, Lord, and and the principles that we find in it for knowing you better and your heart for generosity. Teach us today, Lord, what generosity looks like in a very practical way. Focus our minds, soften our hearts. Lord, give us the courage to respond in whatever way you call us to. For we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Randy Alcorn, in his book, Money, Possessions, and Eternity, he says, at times I crave an audible voice from heaven telling me exactly what I'm supposed to do with my money and possessions. For example, in light of global needs, what should we possess as Christians? Should I own a house? How about a car? What about two cars? And if so, what kind of house? What kind of car? Is it all right to own a nice suit? Can I own one but not three or four? How many shoes are too many? There are many husbands here who would like to have an answer to that question. (laughs) Is it all right to golf once in a while but too extravagant to golf several times a week? There are all kinds of wives who would like an answer to that question. Is it okay to take a vacation that costs $500 but not one that costs $5,000? In short, how can we be sure that we are pleasing God in our financial decisions? This is a complex issue, and it's not easily resolved. Questions around one's priorities and lifestyle can be the source of much personal guilt 
and tension in a marriage and in a family. It can be the source of judgmentalism between people. It's something that can divide people from one another, can create a, 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 a coolness between people. It can also be a source of conflict and division in the church. What should the spending priorities of the church be? How much of our resources as a church should be devoted to helping people here in Calgary? And how much should be devoted to helping people globally? Whether it's our personal lives or it's our life as a church, there are many tough questions that we need to grapple with. And sometimes it would just seem easier if God, along with the scriptures, had provided us with a very detailed manual with all of the answers to these very difficult questions. A number of years ago, I heard Philip Yancey talk about his battle over how to manage his money and his possessions. And for many years, he fully embraced the materialistic lifestyle and enjoyed the fruits of what God had provided. Over time, however, he began to notice that he obsessed over making money and often struggled with anxiety uh, over his um, investments. He also observed over time how his affluence seemed to create distance not only between him and his friends, but between him and the Lord. He concluded this by saying, it seems that millions of us spend a large portion of our lives chasing what eventually proves unsatisfying. He then went on to tell of another period in his life where he headed in the opposite direction. He start, it started when he couldn't shake Bible passages like Proverbs 14, verse 31, that says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Yancey says, I would read God's word and then I would examine the disparity in the world between the rich and the poor, and I knew that I needed to make some changes in my lifestyle. And so we began exploring how other people dealt with this dilemma, and he sought, as he sought to live more simply. He read the story of John Wesley, who early in his ministry decided to live simply and to give away everything that he made above his living expenses. He had a goal in life, and that was to, to die with really nothing in his possession. And when he did pass away, I think they found 45 cents in his pocket. And so Yancey began to make all kinds of changes to simplify his lifestyle. He made sure the car that he drove never had air conditioning or any of the bells and whistles that normally come with automobiles. He became known among his friends for his obsessive concern with getting the very best possible price, buying clothes at used clothing stores and carrying around a thick book of discount coupons. At one point he says, I very proudly calculated all the money I spent on furniture in my three-bedroom house was $500, which gave me great pride. He said, the question I kept asking myself was, is there a lifestyle level above which a Christian should not live? And he says, I kept trying to find out what that lifestyle was. But he says, I eventually found out that no matter what lifestyle I settled on, it really didn't provide the answer. He came to the conclusion that he was really only playing with living a simple lifestyle. He was proud, for example, of his stripped-down automobile until he realized that most people in the world don't even have a car. He says, for years, my wife and I lived in a very modest mobile home to save money, but compared to where most of half the world lives, our mobile home was a palace. And I found, he says, there is no such thing as a pure, simple lifestyle. Even people who are condemning the system for being excessive and wasteful use the system themselves. Printing their perspectives and their viewpoints on million-dollar printing presses 
flying to conferences on airplanes that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and communicating with each other through the use of a multi-billion dollar telecommunications industry. Yancey concluded that most people in North America who seem obsessed with living simply are in many ways just playing games. He said, we, we still learn to read through the best educational systems. We eat the world's most nutritious foods. We're cared for by the world's top doctors in the world's finest medical facilities. And these are all luxuries to most of the world. But his confusion didn't end there. Yancey says, I realize that our economies are built in such a way that we help the poor generally by consuming. For example, he says, if we all decided as Christians to give up the luxury of drinking coffee, that, that is a luxury, isn't it? But anyways, if we decided to give up this luxury, it would likely have a dramatic negative effect on countries like Brazil and Kenya and would particularly have a negative effect on the people in those nations whose livelihood depends on the sale of coffee beans. He says, I began to realize that this world was not as simple as I was trying to make it to be. Yancey says, I ended up that phase of my life which lasted around eight years confused and aware of the complexity and the difficulty of this issue. But perhaps most disturbing, he said, is that I found that ultimately my determined effort to resist the American way of life led me to an obsession and a bondage exactly unlike what Jesus described as the life of grace. He says, I found myself spending so much time and energy thinking about how not to serve money that paradoxically, I ended up serving it. Now let me just pause there for a moment. After hearing Yancey's thoughts on th this very complex issue, some of you are probably thinking, okay, pastor, w what are you saying? Does this mean that we shouldn't exercise discernment in how and where we spend our money? Does this mean that we shouldn't be concerned about living more simply, but that we instead we should just keep going further and further into debt, spending money on things we really don't need in order to keep our economy and the economy of other countries, especially poor countries going? Is, is that what's being said here? Not at all. What Yancey is getting at is there is no magic formula that each of us can follow on how to spend our money or on what it means to live simply. You see, many of us like Yancey really want to honor God by living simply. We want to live simply in order to free up more money and, and, and time to be generous with. Unfortunately, many of us crave a formula, a law, that says, well, here's a list of what you can own and enjoy. Or here's a percentage breakdown of how you should spend your money as a church. And yet, if you read the scriptures you will find that Jesus refused to give out formulas. And he despised the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, who tried to create formulas. In Luke chapter 10, and Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, And love your neighbor as yourself. And among the crowd there was a young man, who went up to him after him making that statement. And in verse 29 we read, he, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus responded with the parable of the Good Samaritan to make the point that your neighbor is whoever comes your way, whoever intersects your life. And I can just imagine the guy who asked this question thinking, oh, come on, Jesus, are you telling me I'm going to have to love everyone? 
I mean, couldn't you just narrow it down a little bit? Give me a list of people that I've considered to be my neighbors. But you see, Jesus didn't do that. He said, if you run into someone who needs your attention and your loving care, that person is your neighbor. You be the good Samaritan to them. In Matthew 18, 21, Peter came to Jesus and asked, how often shall I forgive? Up to seven times? You see, seven times was the standard religious leaders had come up with in that day. And yet Jesus responded to Peter, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. In other words, what Jesus is saying is there is no formula here. You see, Jesus is first and foremost concerned about the state of the heart. When it comes to our money and our possessions, Jesus is saying money is a heart issue. It isn't a mathematical issue. He is far less concerned about what we do with our money, and he is far more concerned about what our money is doing to us. He doesn't ever want us getting to the place where we stop talking to him, where we stop listening to him and inquiring of him, seeking his direction. In other words, where we begin to substitute a close friendship with him with just checking off a list of to-dos and a list of don't-dos. A religious list like going to church or serving and giving to the church or making up a shoebox or a Christmas hamper every year, all of which are good and important. I don't want to minimize that. But the point is, Jesus doesn't want that alone. He wants both an intimate daily friendship with us and us living in obedience to his call to be generous with what he has given to us. And therefore, God doesn't give us a detailed manual on how every dollar that we earn or we receive should be spent or invested. Instead, he gives us principles in the scriptures, many of which we've examined in this series. Principles which spell out God's heart on generosity and also how his economy works, but still leave a lot of latitude for us to come to him daily about our very specific issues and seek his direction for what we will do with our time, with the abilities he's given to us, and the money he's entrusted to us. And so in the time remaining, I just want to review a few principles that are key to developing a God-honoring, generous lifestyle. The first principle to developing a generous lifestyle is this. Do not be deceived by materialism or the love of money. In 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, notice the Apostle Paul did not say that money was the root of all kinds of evil. He said it's the love of money which leads to evil behavior. He wasn't saying here that it's wrong to make money or to have money. He's saying the love of money is behind it all. It leads to greed. It can lead to hoarding. It can lead to stinginess and dishonesty and envy and anger, just to name a few. Money can deceive us into defining our significance on the basis of what we have or what we don't have and tempt us into going into debt, buying things that we really don't need, but we do anyways in order to keep up with others. Worst of all, money can tempt us into believing that money rather than God will provide us with contentment and security and satisfaction in life. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus told the story of a rich farmer who lived for money and prestige. He hoarded and he stockpiled money and possessions, not only out of a sense of pride, of a sense of success, but also, of course, to ensure his family was secure and would not have any needs 
for the rest of their lives. He may have claimed to believe in God, but he lived as if there was no God. He overlooked the needs of other people. He lived for himself. Now, unfortunately, his plans for you know, to take life easy. His plans to eat, drink, and to be merry for the rest of his life were, were rudely interrupted one night by his sudden and totally unexpected death. While he prepared for every possible contingency, he ignored preparing for life's only eventuality, death itself. And as God examined the state of his heart, his priorities, and his passions, the only word that he could use to summarize this man's life was the word fool. Jesus called him a fool because even though he had gained the whole world, he had lost his soul. And Jesus closes his teachings with these sobering words. This is how it will be with whoever with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. There's the principle. Therein is the danger of materialism. The temptation to put your trust in earthly riches and fail to be rich toward God and His call in your life. The first principle to developing a God-honoring, generous lifestyle is not to be deceived by materialism. The second principle is this. Do not be deceived by the opposite extreme, the danger of asceticism. Asceticism is a way of thinking that sees money and possessions as evil or as unspiritual and therefore must be avoided. To the ascetic, the less you own, the more spiritual you are. If something isn't strictly essential, you shouldn't have it. Now, certain ethnic groups pride themselves um, for their frugality, including the Dutch, of course. Uh, we often hear about the Dutch in this regard, and of course, the Germans, which is my heritage. Uh, some people might say, we Germans are cheap, but it ain't so. Just want you to know that. We may be thrifty, we may be frugal, but we are not cheap. When I think about being cheap, I'm reminded of the story about an Englishman, uh, Irishman, and a German. Uh, they all go out for lunch together, and they each order a bowl of soup. Well, just as the soup is served, there's three flies cruising overhead, and they're hungry too, and so they decide to land in the fresh, warm soup, one in each bowl. Now, the Englishman notices the fly in his soup, and he carefully reaches for a silver spoon, and he scoops the fly out of his soup, puts it on a glass ashtray, and covers it with a napkin. Englishmen always do everything with such class. You ever notice that? Yeah. <laughs> well, the Irishman, he sees the fly in his soup. He picks up the bowl. He just goes, like this. Of course, blows real hard, and the fly goes out, and so does half the soup all over the table. I'm not sure what that says about Irishmen. <laughs> the German, he sees the fly in his soup, and he gets mad. Man, does he get mad. He takes that fly by the wings, and he shakes it. And he says, okay, spit it out, all of it. <laughs> we Germans aren't that cheap, okay? <laughs> Just want you to know. But anyways, asceticism isn't about being cheap. It's a conviction that anything that isn't absolutely essential to life should be shunned, including any kind of luxury. And yet in the scriptures, God is portrayed as a giver by nature. The Bible says all that we have is from him. And in 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says that God provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He loves to give good gifts to his children, even as earthly parents love to give good gifts to their children. He wants us to enjoy what he has entrusted to us without guilt. The reason we should live a simpler lifestyle is not because material things are bad. 
but because we want to have more resources available to meet the dire spiritual and physical needs of the world. As someone once said, live simply so that others may simply live. Nor should we deny ourselves nice things just to impress other people. All through the scriptures, as I said a moment ago, we're reminded that God is concerned mostly about what's happening inside, what our motives are for what we do. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If we are intentionally living with less in order to free up more resources to be generous with, then we can know that the God who sees the true state of our heart, we can know that he is pleased with our sacrificial generosity. But if we are living with less and avoiding all luxuries in order to show others what spiritual giants we are, or if we find ourselves regularly judging other people or slandering other believers for having what we feel is too extravagant a lifestyle for a fully devoted follower of Christ, then we have missed the whole point. In short, those whose hearts are genuinely aligned with God's heart will have a loving and a gracious spirit toward other Christians who live differently than they do. Of this we can be certain. Christ doesn't want our differences or disagreement on how money should be invested or our differences about lifestyle or our differences about what we believe the priorities of the church should be to affect our love for him or for one another. That is his desire. But the reality is that sometimes it is these issues that divide us. He wants us to live in grace and to extend grace to others. So if we want to develop a God-pleasing, generous lifestyle, we need to avoid these two ditches. The ditch of materialism and the ditch on the other side of asceticism. And thirdly, if we want to develop a God-pleasing, generous lifestyle, we need to be faithful with what God has entrusted to us. We need to not get all hung up about issues like lifestyle. We need to focus on being faithful with what God's given to us. Jesus taught this principle through a powerful parable in Matthew 25. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 25 and just keep it open as we quickly go through some of the principles that we see here. In this passage, Jesus tells the story of a wealthy man who is going away for a time. He decides to entrust his wealth to three of his servants. To one servant, he gives five bags of gold. To another, two bags of gold. And to the third, one bag of gold. And in verse 16, we read this. The man who received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the one who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, we go on to read that sometime later, the wealthy man referred to as master by Jesus, this master returns and he calls these three fellows to account. The owner is thrilled to hear how the first two fellows stepped out and doubled the investment that he had given to them. In other words, he was pleased with the fact that they were faithful in investing what he had given to them. But he was very displeased, very unhappy with the man who buried what God had given to him. Now in this parable, Jesus is talking about his kingdom. And he gives several principles on how we're to look at what God has entrusted to us and what we're to do with what we have. 
And the first principle is this. Everything that I have, God owns. You've heard that before. It is fundamentally at the heart of all, all generosity principles. Everything we have, God owns. The goal that these three men had was given to them by their master. They were not the owners. They were the managers. The gold belonged to the master. Everything we have, folks, has been given to us by God. And you're going to be all out of sorts if you get that mixed up and you start thinking you're the owner. You're the one who owns the things that you have. The second principle that we see is this. This money was given to advance the master's interests, not the servant's interests. God freely gives us all that we have. And he's okay with us using it and enjoying it. But he wants us to use the gifts he's given to us, the resources he's given to us, primarily to advance his kingdom rather than our own agenda. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. God blesses us not to increase our standard of living. He blesses us to increase our standard of giving. The third principle we see here is we do not all receive the same amount of talents and resources. One man received five bags of gold, the other two, and the third one received one. We are all created equal. We are equally valuable and precious in God's eyes, but we are not equally gifted or given the same amount of resources. Now, we all know some people who have a five-bag gifting. These people have brilliant minds. They, they have more degrees than a thermometer. They, they are wealthy. They are popular. Uh, you know, they have an amazing spouse. And, and if that weren't enough, you know, they, they also have a killer smile and straight white teeth and beautiful thick hair. I mean, we can't stand these people, you know. <laughs> but you see, if you're a person with a one or two bag gifting, the big temptation is to envy the person with the five bag gifting. <laughs> and then, like this one bag servant did, to actually blame God for being unfair in his distribution of talents and gifts. And to use that as an excuse to not do what God wants you to do with the one talent he's given you. One of the principles of this parable is don't let what you believe is the unfairness of life become an excuse for irresponsibility. Rather be faithful with what you've received. Which leads to the final principle I want to touch on. One day, we are going to have to give an account for our lives. We read in verse 19 that the master returns and he calls these three fellows to account. And as I said, the owner is thrilled to hear what the first two fellows accomplished with what he had given to them. And I want you to notice he commended them both the five-bag person and the two-bag fellow, equally. And what, in, in this, what Jesus was teaching us is it's not how many talents or how much money we've been given, but how faithful we've been with what we've received that matters to God. Now, unfortunately, the one-bag fellow buried what he'd received. And his master was very unhappy with him. Verse 26, the master calls him wicked and lazy. Now, when we think of lazy, of course, we think of inactivity. We, we think of the person sitting on the couch watching television all night. But when we think of wicked, we think of someone doing something really evil, really bad. But that's really not the intended meaning here. It's more about disobedience, disobeying God. In other words, what the master was saying to this one-bag servant, 
you refuse to carry out the one thing I assigned you to do. You know, it's like the kamikaze pilot who flew 17 missions. Not exactly what he was told to do. You see, the one talent servant had this once in a lifetime opportunity to do his master's work, and he did nothing because of fear. And so, unlike the other two servants, he never knew the joy of delighting his master. Nor did he have the opportunity to partner with his master in future adventures. Notice in verse 21, the master said to the other two, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Your adventure with me is just starting. However, look at what he said in verse 28 to the one bag servant. The master said about the one bag servant, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. In other words, you forfeit what you don't use. If you refuse to exercise, what happens? You don't get more muscle. You actually lose muscle. If you refuse to practice the sport or the instrument that God has gifted you in, you slowly lose that talent. If we refuse to be generous and hoard the abilities and the money God has given to us, what happens? All that God wanted to accomplish through our generosity is lost. On the other hand, the opposite is also true. If we use what God has given to us, He gives us more. He enriches us with even more so that we can be generous and be even a greater blessing. When we serve, God promises He will multiply the impact of our investment in the lives of other people. And so what Jesus is saying through this parable is essentially this. All that we have is given to us by God. When we trust God and hold what he has given to us with an open hand and we live a life of generosity, we get to witness God do amazing work not only in us but also in the lives of others through us. And unlike those who shrink back and bury what God has given to them, we get to partner with him again and again. We get to experience a spiritual adventure that will not only delight God and grow our faith, but will bless people and start to bring a little heaven to earth. You see, at the end of the day, the issue is not other people having greater abilities or greater resources than we do. The issue is, am I being faithful with what God's given to me? Am I investing that one talent or that limited resource he's given to me in God's kingdom or am I bearing it? Now some people bury what God's given to them because of fear. That was the case of this particular one bag servant. They're afraid of stepping out because they want to be in control. They, they want to protect their dignity and their reputation and avoid failure at all cost. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Denying yourself is saying no to your desires and your need to be in control of your reputation and to put the needs of others before your own. Taking up your cross is saying yes to what God calls you to, despite fear, despite uncertainty, or difficult circumstances that you may be facing. We will always fear stepping out in obedience to God's call until we surrender our lives to Christ. Bob Roberts says to surrender means that Jesus is enough. Until you settle on Jesus being enough in your life, you will have this incessant need for other people's affirmation. You will have this incessant need to be viewed as the best, the most gifted, the most successful, the most liked, the most known. But all that changes when Jesus is truly enough for you. 
Because the focus of your life changes at that point. It becomes about pleasing Him alone. It becomes about finding satisfaction in Him alone. And with that comes true freedom to be who God made you to be and to do what He calls you to do. Some bury their talent because of fear. Others bury it because they think they have nothing to offer. Well, if I'm describing you, then you are believing a lie. A lie that keeps people in bondage. God made you. And that means you are his image bearer. You reflect a part of his glory. Whether you realize it or not, God has given you abilities and gifting and tre a treasure chest of experience that he wants you to share with other people. Those of you who are in the second half of your life, you have so much wisdom to offer young adults and young marrieds in their 20s and 30s. On, on things like leadership and establishing a career and selecting a marriage partner and, and how to have a good marriage and, and, and cultivate a healthy family. Those of you who are young adults, you have no idea the kind of positive influence that you can have in the life of a young person when you decide to step out and invest in a small group of, 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 of youth or children. You know, when I talk to people and I ask them, who besides your parents impacted your spiritual uh, growth the most, almost without fail, they will point to, it, to, to, to the time they were in their teens or perhaps in their childhood at some point. And there was this young adult who took an interest in them and spent time with them and who was on fire for God, who they thought was so cool and they wanted to be just like him. Some have told me that their trajectory of their lives has changed because of the influence of, of, of an individual like that. The same is true for those of you who are in high school or, or junior high. When you step out and shepherd a small group of children, God will use you to not only impact the trajectory of their lives, but also of their eternity. My wife, Gwen, became a Christ follower because of the impact, the example, the friendship of her Sunday school teacher. Friends, what are you doing with what God's entrusted you with? You know, whenever I hear people say that they have nothing to offer, you know, I think of, of Nick Vojek, the, the man with, without limbs, who was with us here at Center Street a few years ago. Nick, of all people, had reason for making excuses and placing blame. Of all people, he had reason to, to spend the rest of his life feeling shortchanged and, and looking at what everyone else has and what everyone else can do. And yet, that is not what he did. He chose to make the most of what he had and to leverage his story to encourage others with disabilities. And God has used him powerfully to not only encourage people everywhere, but to bring thousands to faith in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you feel that your life hasn't gone the way that you hoped it would. Perhaps you feel like circumstances in your life have just really buried you. Perhaps by now you had hoped that you'd have a more fulfilling job, or perhaps by now you had dreams that you'd be married or have a family, or that at least you'd be making a bigger difference than you're making. But you see, the question is, are you going to gripe and complain and make excuses to God? Or are you going to accept that which is in your hands as coming from your Heavenly Father and use it faithfully for His glory? The bottom line is this, all that we have is from our loving God. And when we step out in faith and are generous, with what he's entrusted to us and we do it and invest it for his glory rather than our own. We can know that he will multiply our investment for his ultimate glory whether we see the impact or not. One day we will know that our investment, however small or great it was, made a difference. I celebrate the thousands of you who are being faithful with what God has given to you. 
in small ways and more significant ways. Here's just a small sample of our, of our people being generous in the small things. Just watch this. So we've talked about how to be generous, to be more like Him, to go out on a limb and give. Give your time away. Make someone's day. Smile. Walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Hand out compliments with confidence, knowing that you made a difference in that instance. Remember, our needs will always be met. So live without regret, knowing that all we take with us is people, not stuff. And of that, we can never have enough. It's amazing just simply buying someone a cup of coffee can actually be like the first step of transformation. And there was one morning where I was going to, uh, heading to Timmy's because that was kind of my, my normal routine. And God said to me, I want you to buy for the person behind you. So I started doing that and I've been doing it ever since. And so think about this. We've been blessed. So let's bless others. So a while back, a friend of mine admired a t-shirt that I was wearing and the logo on the t-shirt happened to be the same as the company that he had worked many years for. And he hadn't kept anything from his time there. After the conversation, I really felt the Lord say to me that I needed to give my t-shirt to my friend. So that's what I did. And really struck by how sometimes the little acts of generosity are those that make such a big impact on somebody's life. To serve the community of Forest Lawn, we realized we had to be intentionally authentic. Our neighbors have become our friends, and we've even become the emergency contact for some of their children. In this park during the summer, we would serve 80 to 90 children at a time. The community knows our doors are always open and that they are always welcome. A while ago, I received a $400 gift card, and we really didn't know what to do with it. Our friend David was coming over and had asked us for some gas money, and Tim and I both felt that the Lord was leading us to give the gift card to David. We walked into a gas station, found a guy in a lineup, Holy Spirit said fill up his car, so I did. And then I asked him if he wanted prayer, he said sure. So Holy, I prayed for him and Holy Spirit wrecked his heart in a good way. And then I invited him to church. It's amazing the way that God used the gift that he gave us to bless David and David to in turn to bless someone else. We want to be a generous family by helping other families in our neighborhood. In our young families group, we serve others by babysitting, delivering meals to new moms, and just getting to know those who live around us. Yeah, and when it snows, we uh, bundle up all of our kids and we head outside with all of our shovels and then we clear all of our neighbor's sidewalks. It's a blast. I often take the bus. And while sitting there, I realize that people are cold, tired, lonely, and I wanted to cheer them up. I decided by doing a simple act of giving a cookie, they would be very blessed. And so I got a smile on their faces and I was very blessed. I love baking pies. They were my husband's favorite, uh, apple pie especially. I also love to bake a pie and to take to a new neighbor that's moved in. And some of these neighbors have become good friends and some even come to church with me now. A short time ago, we started living a simpler life. It has allowed us to be more generous with our time and with our money. We have more time to spend with each other and with those in our lives. Living a simpler life can be freeing. What is living generously? It's helping people. It's showing his love. Be an extension of our God. Pray, obey, step into the fray, give yourself away. Live generously. Amen. So again, what are you doing with what God has given to you? I'll close with this. At the end of the movie, Schindler's List, there's a heart-wrenching scene in which the war has officially been, de been declared as over. Oscar Schindler is surrounded by hundreds of Jewish men and women who he literally bought 
from the Nazis to work in his factory in order to save their lives. A spokesman on behalf of the group expresses deep gratitude to Oscar for his kindness, <clears throat> for his generosity in saving their lives and proceeds to embrace him. There's this long pause while Schindler tries to absorb the full meaning of that moment. And as he looks into the eyes of the young men and the young women and, and the other folks there, lives that, have in, that he in fact had saved from certain death, he is overcome with emotion and he begins to weep. The hundreds of grateful Jews who surround him, they're bewildered over why he is weeping until he says, I could have done more. Seeing the people that he saved forced him to confront the hard reality that he could have saved more people if he had only sacrificed more. He points to his car and he says, I could have sold my car and saved dozens more lives. He takes a gold pin and he says, I could have saved several more lives with this. And he doubles over, weeping in agony, crying out, I could have done more. You know, folks, in this series of messages on the basis of God's word and with the Spirit's guidance and help, I have sought to help us to understand what's really going to matter in the end. I've tried to help us realize that through the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there's only one thing that we can rescue or take with us to heaven, and that is people. Moments after we die, like Schindler, we'll know exactly how we should have lived and where we should have invested our time and money. The Bible teaches that on that day, the Lord will wipe away every tear from our eyes, which tells me for at least a brief moment in heaven, there's going to be some tears shed there. And I wonder if those tears won't be tears over missed opportunities, tears over misplaced priorities. My prayer is that none of us on that day will need to shed tears of regret and say, I could have done more. But that we will only shed tears of joy in seeing the impact that our generosity had in the lives of people. Friends, the good news is this. Regardless of the past, we are still in a position to do now what we know will matter then. May what will be most important to us then be most important to us now. Before I pray, I want to remind you of the opportunity we all have to exercise generosity in a very practical way through giving our pocket money to help meet the very practical needs of the hurting and the less fortunate, both here in Calgary and around the world. Just take that little envelope, check the thing, and just take some of your pocket money and be sure to hand it in as you head out. Would you stand with me, please? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.